What I'd like to do now is to derive the um, uh, simplifying discounted cash flow formulas, or formula M, by using actually algebraic uh, arguments. So this is something that uh, very often bachelor students uh, really cringe with their teeth on. So here is the algebra, and it's essentially going to be based on a little lemma, which I would like to uh, introduce now. Lemma means that there are going to be some preparatory simplifying computations that we are going to apply all over and over again. It's really simple, though. you don't want to call this proposition a theorem. It's elementary. Suppose that x is going to be finite and smaller than 1, actually, in absolute value. So any value between, uh, say, uh, minus 1 and 1 is going to be OK. And the question is going to be, what is the value of s so if you take now a sequence with a geometric progression here where the term is going to be x. So 1 plus x plus x squared. And we're going to have a last term here, x to the power t here. So here you recognize already a little bit the DCF formula, 1 divided by 1 plus r, 1 plus g to the power t divided by 1 plus rt. So this stuff here you're going to find in this formula here. This is going to be the intuition. So what's the value of this uh, expression here? Hmm. So the idea is um, to rewrite it. So if you're stuck, um, rewrite it till you get the uh, illumination. S is equal to 1 plus x uh, plus x squared or plus, plus x of t. And so at this stage, you try things. Okay, I can, uh, for instance, consider now what would happen if I take x times s. Uh, if I take x times s, I see that I'm going to have here as a first term x, as a second term here x squared, and then here I'm going to have at some point xt, and uh, the last term, which is going to be the xt, multiplied by x, here is going to give me x to the power t plus 1. Hmm. But now we see that this term is equal to this, this one to that one, this one to this one, so the next idea could be actually to subtract the one from the other. So let's do this. I take s minus xs is going to be then x minus x, x squared minus x squared, xt minus x to the power t. And uh, all these terms here are therefore simplified. Tuck, 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 tuck. And I'm going to be remaining now with uh, the following. I'm going to have s minus xs, which is going to be the same as 1 minus x, which multiplies s. This here is going to be equal to 1 minus so xt plus 1. Remember, this is going to be also minus. So and therefore, I'm going to get that s is going to be 1 minus xt plus 1 divided by 1 minus x. Now we can discuss also a little bit the particular cases. Suppose um, you had now x uh, which is going to be equal to 1. What happens in this case? If you're going to have x is equal to 1, in this case, uh, 1 minus x is going to be equal to 0, and you have something which uh, is not going to make any sense, because essentially you're going to divide 1 by 0, which is going to be infinity. So this is not going to work. You have to go one step back. Okay? You can only apply these reasonings if you're going to have uh, 1 minus x finite. You are not allowed, actually, to divide the right-hand side if 1 minus x is not defined. So this is the, the trap here. So you need to go actually back and say that if you're going to have all the x's which are constant, in that case you're going to have here 1 plus x plus x squared, and the last one which is going to be t. So it's essentially saying that you're going to have here 1, which is going to be x to the power 0, and then we're going to have the first power up to power t. And so in that case, so suppose that x is going to be equal to 1. In this case, you're going to have here s is going to be like 1 plus big t here. It's not going to be equal to t, it's going to be equal to t plus 1, because you're going to have like 1, 2 to t, and this gives me now t times 1, and then you get the first one. So s, in this case, is going to be 1 plus t. There's also an additional interesting case uh, I would like to discuss right now, under the assumption that you're going to have x on an absolute value, which is going to be smaller than 1, and this is the case when you're going to have x going to infinity. x becomes really large. Sorry, not x becomes really large, t becomes really large. t goes to infinity. If t goes to infinity, what is going to happen? Suppose that I have now x is equal to 1 half. So if I take x to a certain power, 
it is going to give me first 1 divided by 1 fourth, um, then 1 uh, divided by 8, um, 1 16. So um, at some point it's going to be uh, 1 divided by 1024, uh, and so forth. It gets smaller and smaller. And it means that in the limit, um, in the limit as, um, as t goes to infinity, um, you write it with an arrow and, say, and write about the arrow, the big t now goes to infinity. In this case, s is going to become 1 divided by 1 minus x. The x to the power t plus 1 vanishes. Now we are going to apply this formula to the different cases of growing annuities and so forth. The time has come to apply the lemma, which told you what is going to be the expression for a sum here of big T terms that are growing at the rate of x here, which is 1 minus x to the power t plus 1 divided by 1 minus x. In the case where we need to assume that x in absolute value is going to be smaller than 1, and we would like now to apply this formula here for the annuity. And once we have the annuity formula, we are going to go to infinity and get the perpetuity formula. And we do this for the case where cash flows are constant, the first case. Okay, so let's rewrite what is going to be the uh, annuity, present value of annuity. It's going to be c times c divided by 1 plus r plus c divided by 1 plus r squared, um, and so forth. Um, and I see that I can actually factor now c divided by 1 plus r, and I'm going to get 1 plus 1 divided by 1 plus r. And let me write now one more term just to make sure that everybody grasps it. But now you get a term which is 1 divided by 1 plus r squared, and so forth. But now here, it's very easy. We have exactly the same thing as we had before. Okay, we're just going to have here a situation where we're going to have x. Let's be a little bit careful about the last term. So we have c divided by 1 plus r plus c divided by 1 plus r squared. In the case of an annuity, we're going to have a terminal term here, which is going to be then c divided by 1 plus r to the power t. So this is a term I definitely need to also incorporate here in my formula. And what's the last term in my expression here? Tokyo, I close the parenthesis. So the last term here is going to be then well, we have factored out c divided by 1 plus r, so it's going to be 1, the c is in front of all this. Um, and then on the denominator, we're going to get here 1 plus r power t minus 1. Because we had factored out the 1 plus r. So the sum here doesn't go to big t, it goes to t minus 1. And now we can write that all this formula here is going to be equal to c divided by 1 plus r. And then it's going to be like 1 minus um, 1 divided by 1 plus r to the power t. So here we have t terms, we get to t plus 1. Here we have t minus 1, so we're going to go to t here. And I need to divide this by what corresponds here to 1 minus x. And x is one of these 1 plus r. So I'm going to have here 1 divided by 1 plus r. And that's now the computation I need to do. It looks difficult, but it's not. On the denominator here, we got 1 minus 1 divided by 1 plus r. So I'm going to actually uh, multiply like the number denominator here by 1 plus r. And when I do this, I'm going to get uh, 1 plus r minus 1. So this is going to be r. But if I'm going to multiply the denominator by 1 plus r, I also need to multiply the numerator by 1 plus r. Which means that I can rewrite this formula as being equal to c times 1 plus r divided by 1 plus r. And then here I'm going to have a term here which is going to be like 1 minus 1 divided by 1 plus r to the power t. Divided by here something that is going to be 1 plus r minus 1, which is going to be r. I repeat them. I multiply here both the numerator and the denominator by 1 plus r. Okay, 1 plus r. This is going to give me this term here. And I also want on the denominator. On the denominator, then I'm going to end up with 1 plus r minus 1. This 1 plus r gets simplified then by the term that I multiplied with. And so I'm going to have 1 plus r minus 1 gives me r. The numerator here doesn't change. And I have here 1 plus r as a factor. Now there are simplifications that uh, I have to, or can, I can make. And this is always the best moment. This here cancels. And oh, surprise, surprise, I get now that the present value here of the annuity 
is going to be equal to c divided by r, this is the perpetuity, minus 1 minus, and then I'm going to have the shifted perpetuity, which starts at time big T here. And so I need to subtract this one to get the finite stream. In the earlier part of the course, we started with the perpetuity, then we got the annuity here. <coughs> now I propose that we do both the annuity and then the perpetuity, and we get the perpetuity by going to the limit. We need to verify that uh, we can actually go to the limit, and we need to assume that 1 divided by 1 plus r is going to be smaller than 1. So we divide 1 by something, and it needs to be smaller than 1, which means that r needs to be positive. Okay. As soon as r is going to be positive, you divide 1 by something that's bigger than 1, and so it's going to be the resultant smaller than 1. Interest rates, in general, are going to be bigger than zero when you discount uh, real life uh, cash flows. So assume that r is going to be positive, um, in that case, so we can take the limit, and if t goes to infinity, in that case you're going to have the situation where there's column 1 divided by 1 plus r to the power t goes to zero as t goes to infinity, and we end up with the annuity formula which takes the limit limit case, the limit situation, PV of the present value of the perpetuity, we team is going to be C divided by R, as we know already. So it's a very complicated way of actually redefining uh, the C divided by R. We knew it already from the simple thought experiment that we made, and here we derived it properly. Up to you to choose whatever method you prefer. What I'd like to do now is to treat the growing annuity in perpetuity. We still have the lemma which gives us the sum of a finite uh, number here of growing terms um, at the uh, progression of x here, and uh, we would like now to compute the present value of the growing annuity, which is defined by this formula here. It's c divided by 1 plus r, and then c grows by 1 plus g, and, and so forth, so 1 plus r squared. The numerator always has an index minus 1, so the last term that we have is 1 plus r to the power t and 1 plus g to the power t minus 1. The computations here are exactly identical to the case of the non-growing annuity in perpetuity. We are going to factor out c here divided by 1 plus r, recognize what is going to be the value of x, and then face the algebra. So this is going to be c divided by 1 plus r which multiplies 1 plus um, 1 plus g divided by 1 plus r, so forth, 1 plus g divided by 1 plus r to the power t minus 1. We recognize here the formula with the x is going to be 1 plus g divided by 1 plus r. To have x in absolute value to be smaller than 1, we need to assume that g is smaller than 1, and if this is going to be the case, so this formula is going to be written like c divided by 1 plus r. I apply the lemma, it's going to be 1 minus the progression here, 1 plus g divided by 1 plus r to the power t, divided by 1 minus 1 plus g divided by 1 plus r. The numerator here is to the power t, because here I have t minus 1, this is my last term, and it's like having this formula here with t minus 1 and t here. Now, for some algebra, I multiply the numerator and the denominator by 1 plus r. I'm going to get down here 1 plus r minus 1 plus g. This is going to be again the r minus g. On the numerator, I multiply by 1 plus r, which is going to simplify with the 1 plus r here. And so I can immediately now write the result. It's going to be c divided by r minus g here. The r minus g comes from this part here, which multiplies 1 minus 1 plus g divided by 1 plus r, this is the uh, reason of the progression here, to the power t, like this. So this is going to be the present value of the growing annuity, and we recognize here the perpetuity minus then a correcting factor uh, to take into account that we're going to a finite stream, and so we need to subtract a new perpetuity, but the first term is going to be given then by c times 1 plus g to the power t. To get now the perpetuity formula, we again assume that t goes to infinity, and if t goes to infinity, in the assumption that g is going to be smaller than r, it's going to 
be like you having pizzas and now you have a new brother and sister, the larger the number of people you have around the table to, with whom you have to share the pizza, the smaller this is going to get. And uh, if you're going to then have t, which then goes to then to infinity, a smaller and smaller amount uh, then goes to, uh, um, if you raise it to a certain power, 10, 20, 30 becomes extremely small. And so this term here is going to vanish and we get immediately that the present value of here of the growing perpetuity is going to be c divided by r minus g. Formula that we have seen before, which is going to be very useful in the context of valuing firms such as Facebook, and we understand intuitively that r is going to be close to g here. In that case, we are going to divide here a number by something that is going to be very, very small, and so the resulting number here is going to be very large. Suppose that c is going to be like 100 million, and suppose that r is going to be equal to g plus 1 percent. For instance, this can be 10 and this can to be 11. In that case, so the present value of the growing perpetuity is going to be 100 divided by 0 0.01. And this is going to give the 10 to the power of 4, that's 10,000. That's a lot. But we understand now that if you make a small mistake here in terms of the uh, growth rate, for instance, that the growth rate um, is actually not 10% uh, but only 9%. Uh, so in that case, uh, the R here is going to uh, uh, be also something, let, let's, let me rephrase this. Suppose that uh, you're going to have uh, the R which is going to be 10%, uh, but suppose that the G is not going to be 9%, uh, but it's going to be like 8%. In that case, uh, the difference between the two is going to be like 2%. In this case, you're going to have 100 divided by 0 0.02. And instead of getting now 10,000, okay, you multiply everything by 2, and you're going to have only 5,000. So small uncertainties here on the denominator are going to have absolute dramatic consequences here in terms of the value. And this justifies why some values of firms are really oscillating very heavily. The smallest piece of news is going to affect them dramatically then your information set, and this means that it's going to have also a big impact on the prices.